All right, I've just hit the record button. And um, what I think we might do is just, um, I'll just ask for any questions up front before we get started. And we've still got a minute or two to go, so I'll just give people a chance to log in still. Um, hello, Rosalind, how are you? And um, just, just wondering if, if anyone's got any questions they'd like to ask up front. No. Oh, I'm all good at the moment. I'm just still trying to get my head around the task for assessment too. Fabulous. Well, so no, I hope to talk a bit about that tonight. Um, I've, I've had quite a few emails about it, so I'll, I'll feed back what I can tonight. But please feel free to jump in any time and ask what you need to know. Okay. I've just re-watched like, um, week seven and week eight again, all those, um, the Russell stuff. So, um, and took a lot of notes, so hopefully with what you say tonight should qualify some of that. Let's hope. But please feel free to jump in and we'll, we'll do what we can. Thank you. <coughs> all right, a small group today. Obviously, there's some assessment due at the moment, which is always a, an impact. But the nice thing is we, um, we do record these sessions and we um, get them into where they need to be for you on, uh, on the Zoom session link which is on the left-hand side under assessment on the unit homepage. So don't forget that's there um, because I've actually published there. Some of you will be doing assessment task two using the, um, the early years learning framework. Um, and it actually prompted a really good email this week from Jesse. Um, so what I've decided to do is rather than answer a thousand emails, I've put up a, a 27 minute video which links the early years learning framework um, to the ACS. Um, and the goal there is to try and um, help you, um, you know, just, just indicate for you that it's, it's not that difficult to do um, the zero to five uh, learning age group, um, to do a digital card for them, um, because the early years learning framework gives you some, some really productive pedagogies and gives you some clear guidelines and learning outcomes. So there's at least five learning outcomes there with it, you know, possibly 20 elaborations uh, over all five. So we'll talk a little bit about that, but please, um, if you're in doubt and you need that information, have a look at the video. Um, it's, I didn't put it up for everybody because um, it really is only relevant to those doing the zero to five early years learning card. Um, but there you go, it is there for you now. So look, let's get started. It is six o'clock, it's 6.01 in fact. And we've got a little bit to get through this, this week um, because this is the week where we start to look at ourselves and our own knowledge base um, around the biological sciences. Now, um, let's face it, most of us are doing an education degree. Um, we're not doing science. Um, the chances are that um, science is, um, well, let's face it, it, it's probably perhaps not one of our strongest areas. Um, certainly the research indicates that um, science is one of those areas where um, teachers feel less confident. Um, and even when they become um, teachers in schools, um, you know, just the presence of, of wet labs, the presence of science labs, the presence of material, um, the resources that would support a good science program often aren't available to you. So we finish up being pseudoscientists. And I don't mean that we're into the occult and we read cards and we, we love tarot and things like that. But what I'm saying is we, we assume, you know, the role of pseudoscientists, that is, we're looking at day to day in your life, authentic science questions. And they're the areas where we try to motivate our kids and, and try to get our learning going. So let's have a look at this week. Um, this week on the Moodle, so we, we actually went through a, a learning cycle this week. And one thing that's become apparent to me after, after going through the grading process, um, your results um, should be available to you this week. Um, I know all your markers are finalising things at the moment. Um, hopefully most of those marks will come in tomorrow. We'll do our final moderation. So we've got a two-step process. First of all, you get marked. And then any doubts, the markers, we all come together and, and uh, for instance, any papers that are borderline pass fail, we all come together and review them. Any papers that are in the high distinction range, we all come together and review them. Anybody who's sitting uh, borderline credit, um, high distinction, we review. Um, and we, we go through the process of moderation. Now, those of you going to high school teaching will fully understand that. Um, there's a lot of reforms going on at the moment with the QSSA uh, or QSAA looking at... Um, moderation and, and, and grouped assessment um, in, in the, the senior year level. So um, moderation is an important process. So first you get your grade, and the reason I can't release them is because that's your first grade. They then have to be moderated, which is the second step in the process. But I'm hoping at this stage that we'll be able to release those results by Friday so you'll know how you've gone. But one thing that's become apparent to me is that not a lot of people are actually following instructions and following the clues laid down in the Moodles. 
we were really explicit with assessment task number one that you had to base it in a unit of primary uh, primary connections or a unit of primary science and, and would you believe as high as about 40 percent of students have completely ignored that request now i don't know how you can ignore that if you look at the criteria but clearly some people have um, and to their detriment because they're now borderline pass fail so it, it's going to be a really interesting scenario how that winds down so we've got a busy day moderating thursday um, but hopefully, um, you know, please have a look at the Moodle material. So for that reason, you know, here this week we've got, we're, we're looking at, at week eight. So we're looking at biology and we're looking at biological overviews, biological sciences overview. Now, unfortunately, I do not think your text Loxley is very good um, in this area. But having said that, um, it does give you plenty of scope to actually develop authentic day-to-day -day in the classroom science inquiries and, and I think for that reason it's more than adequate but clearly um, you know well how much science do you need to know I mean that's a, you know, how long is a piece of string the reality is Loxley chunks off little bits of science deals with it reasonably well and if you can get that and you understand that much science then you will be very successful in your classroom because you don't need to know a lot about science but you just need to know a, a little bit about science enough about science inquiry processes enough about science as a human endeavor and you can locate yourself in any context and be reasonably successful and effective as a teacher the rest comes down to TPAC or pedagogy as we'll talk about later so some of the things we began this week by looking at um, the engage stage where Dan Christian now Dan Christian's just brilliant um, he talks about the earth and, and, and uh, its paradigms or its epochs or its episodes um, and and he takes us through the development of the earth and basically the, the history of mankind in 15 minutes and it's just a brilliant um, brilliant presentation um, I love Dan and I love the work he does and even his approach the way that this video starts off the entire studio is in black it's dark and he just entirely reenacts and narrates the Big Bang so if you're not familiar with earth and space science and you're not familiar with biological history this is a great place for you to start a really really good place for you to start all right, moving on. Once we've done that, um, I've asked you in the Moodle to go through and actually look at Loxley. Let's use this textbook, let's put it to work. Let's take it for a test drive. So you'll find that there I've put up what we call Word document chapter summaries. And in other words, you know, as a teacher of science, you've got to have a little bit of knowledge. So chapter 12, chapter 13, chapter 14, I put up a Word document. And just to guide you, I've actually done chapter 12 for you. So that has been done. So you will see that in there as an example of just going through Loxley, sitting down with a quiet cup of coffee, sitting down enjoying yourself, you know, put your hair in, cur in curlers, whatever it is you like to do, clip your toenails, and then drag out Loxley and open your summary and start, start to fill in what you can. From Loxley, we then went to look at digital curation. And we're building here on the work from Russell Stennett last week, where we talked about flipping the classroom. You've got to do a digital card. Now, a digital card is usually a flipped activity because if you look at the description of that card, it says it's got to be for individuals or small groups of learners. So in other words, we're talking about autonomous learning. When we build a card, the resources we create for that card, that card must be reliable. And for that reason, we go through a process, the term given to it is digital curation. Um, it's a fancy term, but this little video I've put up for you actually explains to you what it's for why it works and if you can get into the habit of curating your resources your digital resources you're always going to be able to produce flip classrooms on the drop of a hat if you've got a good library of resources and so please have a look at that this week because that's essential to your digital card that process of becoming a good curator and a good tracker of digital resources from there we start to look at the biological sciences overview and the big task for this week is where I ask you to get on the discussion board to either use Scootle. Now, Scootle is a fabulous resource. If you don't have an account, it's free. Don't worry. Register, get your Scootle account, and you will find on there so many digital resources that you can use for your teaching. The task I've given you this week is to two, locate two simulations or learning assets that show the structural difference between plant and animal cells and then design a flipped learning activity that requires your students to list the cell parts. So it's very focused. Come up with you know, two simulations or two learning assets and then design a flipped learning activity for a particular age group that requires your students to list those cell parts. Okay, that are common to both cell types, that is animal and plant, 
and suggest why the different parts exist. Hint, consider the, the function of each part. So the aim is to get you to look at this whole notion of digital curation, this whole notion of flipped learning, and the power that is going to bring to your teaching. Now, I would not be promoting this, and Russell Stennard would not be as popular as he is if flipped classrooms were not a huge um, advantage to teachers. Think about it. You've got MAPLAN. You've got so many competing priorities. You've got assessment. You've got C to C. You've got all these different things happening in your classroom. What you need to do as a teacher is create more time. How do you create more time? You play with time. You do what Einstein did. You bend time and space. And you can bend time and space as a teacher by introducing a flipped classroom, by taking the knowledge and comprehension components out of your learning and dropping them into a digital format. And that digital format can be really, really good pedagogy. It can be really good pedagogy. Yes, it's very behaviorist. Okay, it is behaviorist. It can be behaviorist. But that behaviorist approach, that initiation of behaviorism is go here, look at this, analyze that, that approach can actually expand exponentially. The sort of saying, what did you learn from that? What can you apply from that situation to this situation? And then here are three other situations. What do you learn from this? What can you apply here? So we can actually open up what appears to be a very narrow, narrow behaviorist perspective. We can go through cognitive steps and then we can engage in really rich socio-cognitive um, and constructivist um, steps. Um, you know, Wittgenstein talks all about this. Um, Vygotsky talks all about it right through to Siemens, people using digital technology. We can go through these steps and we can really, really expand that initial point of interaction. That is the power of a flipped classroom. And what it means is you'll have kids in there at differentiated, differentiated levels of performance. Your higher kids, your stronger kids can go ahead and do this work. Okay, all you need to do is give them clear structured tasks and check in with them. Your middle group are going to need some, you're going to need to be the meddler in the middle. You're going to need to get in there and do a little bit of work, a little bit of gathering, a lot of formative assessment. And then you're going to have your lower groups of learners who will be plodding along. And they're the ones that you'll be able to spend more time with because you've flipped the classroom, you've differentiated need, and you've created time and space. You've fooled with time and space in the same way that Einstein or any great science fiction movie has. So let's get out of science fiction into science reality. This week we talk about teaching biology. How many, how many possible ways is, are there to teach biology? Um, and Loxley, okay, is fabulous on biology. I, I think it, it does it really, really well. If you can understand the principles in Loxley, I think you'll be able to teach most biological units. Um, we can learn about science by accessing websites. David Attenborough is one of my favourites. Every time I hear that voice, my back stiffens, my head turns, and I think, wow, what are we going to see? Newspaper articles are good for science. Um, the ABC are fantastic. Um, environmental issues, loss of habitat, endangered species, agriculture, food issues. You know, a, a really great phenomenon sweeping Australia at the moment is this notion of rewilding. You know, it's an agricultural and, and, and environmental challenge. We've stripped the country. You know, right now we, we are deforesting Australia at, the same, at a higher rate than Brazil is deforesting the Amazon. Um, you know, we're creating huge environmental problems going forward. Yes, trees will re regrow, but the problem is the undergrowth doesn't grow. And when the undergrowth doesn't grow, the soil doesn't get its fertilisation. When the soil doesn't get enriched, we start to see species decline and we start to see species um, evaporate and, and obviously become extinct. Um, and once plants disappear, of course, animals disappear because they're food groups. Um, all of these huge issues, this, this issue of rewilding, keep your eye out for it. It is growing in popularity worldwide. It's not conservation. Rewilding actually suggests that conservation is science gone wrong. It's a really interesting phenomenon. Keep your eye out for it because it's something you'll be able to use in your classrooms going forward. Newspaper articles, the readership nationally is targeted at an age 12 level. So it's accessible to most upper primary school kids. But for the early childhood and the lower primary school level, newspapers are out of the, uh, the focus. The other thing we can do with our, our techniques is keep it local. Over the next four weeks, when we look at um, biological and air, um, space and, and earth sciences, we're going to talk about what's, what's happening locally. Um, and, you know, we're seeing some amazing sustainability exercises um, Australia-wide. Um, in New South Wales, it's a 
big curriculum issues. Schools are actually building their own chook houses, their own ve vegetable patches. They're doing totally integrated, um, sustainable um, um, rubbish and recycling systems within their own school and reducing their actual um, landfill waste down to zero for school populations of five and 600 kids. This is all being done as classroom activities. You know? and, and this is science. We don't need a wet area. We don't need Bunsen burners. We don't need a whole range of scientific equipment. Okay, all we need is a perspective and an inquiring mind. And some of the things we'll look at today is invertebrates in the school ground. Um, we're gonna look at the, the adaptive behavior of small animals. What I'm gonna try and do today is model for you a learning sequence. Now, a learning sequence is at the, is at the heart of assessment task number two. Okay, now we're gonna look at invertebrates in the school ground. They're, they're obviously, um, the focus is the adaptive behavior of small animals. Um, and of course, that's connected to what plants you have in your school environment. So we can see here that we've got an entire eco web just sitting here in, in, in this one little inquiry process. We're going to look at what we call a learning sequence. Now, prior to today, we've talked about units of study, primary connections. And, and I was really quite horrified to see that 40% you know, of you did not base your know, Peshakusha on, on a particular unit of study. That's a really scary statistic because I thought that was quite explicit. It's even there, you know, assessment criteria number two, base it on a unit of study. And some people just went ahead and talked about engagement as if there was no tomorrow. They went ahead and talked about indigenous perspectives as if though that was science in its own right. Sorry, you've got to connect it. You've got to connect it to science. This is what a teacher does. And today we're going to talk about a learning sequence. Now, assessment task two is not about a unit, it's about a sequence. Now, we know that some of the primary connections unit had as many t as 10 or 11 lessons, and some of those lessons go for one and two hours, so they're whole term units. Much too big for assessment task number two. We're gonna look at a learning sequence. So what we want you to do is have a look at a, a, a primary connections unit, and from that unit, pick two or three lessons, a sequence of lessons. Embedded in that sequence of lessons will be one of the five E's because you'll be plucking it from the program at a certain stage. So you'll know what you're going to do. If it's early, obviously be in the engage stage, the diagnostics. If it's you know, mid early, it will be in the explore and explain stages. If it's towards the end, you could be highlighting scientific skills, okay, inquiry skills. And if it's at the very end, you're then doing as Bloom would do, you're taking your knowledge comprehension, you're applying it to wild world settings. So, we're gonna pick some lessons. We're gonna call them a learning sequence. And around that learning sequence, your task is to design two digital cards. One for the zero to five age group, if you're an early childhood person, and one for foundation to year three. If you're a primary school's um, um, registered person or to be registered, then zero to three, okay, the foundations to year three as your first card and your second card at the upper end, seven to nine. You can see what we're trying to do here. We're trying to say to you, pick two pedagogies, pick two ends of the curriculum, senior and junior. And from that, produce two digital cards, which reflect your ability as, as a, a you know, potential teacher, as a teacher in training, to reflect your ability to identify the learning needs of that, that, those age groups within that science framework using digital cards. That's the challenge. Let's go on and have a look at this. So when we look at science, and, and we look at, at biological science, we've got to ask ourselves, what is it? Um, and, and look, to be honest, kids don't know it either. Clearly, they, they don't know biology. It registers, it means nothing to them, okay? Um, the same as a caramel sundae meant nothing to them until they tasted one. But once they taste biology, they're gonna love it. So here's where you can be so powerful. Now, Kerry and Stephens uh, found that, that movement, action, is the main criteria that children use to determine for, for whether an, abje, an object is alive. Now, a lot of the biology, for instance, in, in biological science is around living things, okay? We can see that as one of the elaborations. And, and we see some of these quotes, the sun is hiding behind the clouds. Now, unfortunately, our language is full of metaphors. And our metaphors sometimes bend the truth. You know, the sun is rising, the sun doesn't rise, okay? It's the earth that rotates around the sun. Butterfly life cycles, eggs, trees spawning fruit, okay? Are they, you know, are they alive? Are trees alive? And really interesting, ask some young children, are trees alive? And sit back and enjoy the perspectives that they bring out. 
Okay? You never slap them down. And this is what we do with inquiry teaching. We work with that. Okay? And we'll look at a couple of examples in a minute. And we, as teachers, we, we want to know when the student scientific framework shifts. You know, can scientific understanding be limited by language? And yes, of course it can. Okay, language is, you know, is fire alive? The flames were licking and dancing. Okay, really? They sound alive. Most children actually think fire is alive. A really interesting phenomenon. So the question here is, can the teaching of science help build the, uh, learners build their concept of living organisms by asking them to focus on the similarities shared by different classes of living things? A really simple you know, classification question. Living things, what are their characteristics? What are their similarities? What do they share? Therefore, by definition, what is a living thing? A scientific inquiry. So what does it mean to be alive? And this is one of the things that comes through many of our primary connections unit. Um, so we often begin with a, with a, a pretest, and, and you know, children can often say that fires are alive, um, you know, that trees are not, um, that spiders are not animals, that whales are fish. Okay, all of these different things that children come up with. And the question is, why do they come up with? What criteria, what set of criteria under, underpins their understandings? And this is, you know, what we know to be the diagnostic stage, the first E, the pretest. And here's a couple of, you know, things when we look at it, two, two responses from two children that came out of um, Russell Titler's um, 2011 study, what we call the RILS project, where he's looking at scientific representation as a great way to work with young children. So metaphors, representation, mental models, all those things. So the earth... Um, let's face it, first person said, you know, the first response, living, it moves, grows and lives, living because it changes all the time. So we're getting some insight here. These are what we call attributions, learner attributions. Fire is non-living. Fire moves, but it doesn't live. This other student says fire is living. It runs on fuel and is full of energy. So we're starting to see some attributions of living things here. The sun is living like the earth. And this other student says it's living because it changes all the time. Again, we can see this notion of change. Something that changes has got to be alive. Now, a little bit later, we'll look at the notion of a papaya, putting two papaya on a tree bench. We'll see what happens. A virus. This student seems to be you know, have quite a good scientific concept here. It's living. A virus eats, moves, grows, and dies. Look at the attributions. Okay, and this one says it's living because it attacks. Again, it's got movement. A daffodil. It still lives after a while. It dies. And it lives because it drinks. So we can see all of these attributions. Now, okay, we could look at that as a teacher and sort of say, okay, five out of five is right, four out of five, almost right, you know, moving on. You know, let's get over ourselves. Or we could look at it as a teacher and sort of say, well, wait a minute. You know, there's some idea of living and non-living here, but really there's no consistent set of criteria to help these students make future decisions. You know, so how would you support, support students one and two? How would you deal with this as a teacher? Let's take a more constructivist approach, a freshly picked papaya. Now, for those of you thinking you can't do science, rethink that. Because here, all you need is two papaya. Consider the similarities over time between you know, two pawpaws from the same tree. One gets picked and one gets left on the trunk. Observe them. Chart them. Get your kids to photograph them. Get them to draw them at two-day intervals. Okay, if you can, without pulling the pie off through, get them to weigh them. Get them to look at skin texture. Get them to create all of these metrics, all of this data that they can use to start to inform their frameworks. Now, if both were green at the time of picking, one gets placed on a sunny shelf and it's going to change colour from green to yellow at a similar pace to the one that's still attached to the tree. Okay, at different rates, both will eventually show signs of water loss and decay. Okay, how parts of the flesh are depicted unfair, are able to maintain themselves in a con condition not dissimilar to that of a young paw ripening on the trunk. So what we'd look at here is the whole notion of you know, this fruit is still on the tree, it's alive. This fruit is not on the tree. Is it still alive? It, it's still changing. We can challenge some of those attributions and assumptions the learner's been making. And we can get closer to building a framework for learners around this question of what is living and what is non-living. Animals. Bell investigated which organisms children thought of as animals and why they thought of them as animals. So here we can see cows were really no problem. Whales were a little bit more problematic. No, they're fish. Fish are not animals. Organisms, spiders and worms, regard as animals between only about 20 to 50% of primary school children. 
Children aged five to six are more likely to think of spiders and worms as animals than are children aged nine and ten. So wait a minute. Wait a minute. At five and six, where we're supposedly no less, we think they're animals. By the time we get to age nine and ten, we, you know, the majority of children think they're not. So there's been some unlearning here or there's been some teaching of some misconceptions because the children are now three or four years older and their concept is shifting and shifting away from biological science. So kids gain knowledge of biological groups, reptiles, insects, types of worm. They lose the inclusive animal concept. So the thing is, if focusing on difference is the best way to build these concepts. You know, these are all the questions we've got to work out as teachers. Titler does this wonderful example of a learning sequence. And this is really what we're talking about in assessment task two. The focus here is invertebrates in the school ground. And it's a really rich task, um, probably difficult to read in the time frame we've got as a PowerPoint. But basically what they do is students go through a, a pretest and they debate the characteristics of living things. They work on computers to construct interactive questionnaires about what is a living thing. They discuss what it's like to work as a team of scientists, finding out what living things exist in their school ground and why. And then they perhaps even go out as the next phase into their own habitat um, with their workbooks and their notebooks, and they report observations back to their class. They do their habitat explorations to working out what is the habitat, what happens in that habitat, okay, and how do things within that habitat interact and depend, interdependence on each other. Students then went on to explore habitats and to answer research questions. They record environmental conditions, wet days, dry days, sunny days, night time. Can you imagine organising an overnight camp where you all went out with torches and did nocturnal observations? What fun. Look at that. What's going to happen in your room there? Um, and note that the number of each invertebrate it found. So here we're actually going to start building some basic um, web some food and insect and, and animal web, some eco web structures, and drew, draw these and annotate the drawings to describe body structures and behaviours. So we're starting to get you know, down to some classification here, down to some criteria. We're starting to remove belief and replace it with observable content. Students collected one in, in, invertebrate and observed it with a view to constructing a model that would represent the movement or feeding of that invertebrate. They used digital microscopes, they made annotated drawings, time sequence drawings, and described how the body structures and behaviours of the invertebrate are adapted to the habitat. I would go one further. If you can, and if you have the resources, why not use mobile phones? Why not shoot video? Why not shoot you know, um, stills and, and do animations? Use some of the, the wonderful free animation software that posts photos, 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 and, and runs them together at very short periods of time to create digital animation. Students conducted group-generated activities using mealworms and stick insects to establish the ways of describing body structures. Now, here we've got mealworms are very different to stick, stick insects, okay? Stri creatures with no real body form and structure versus stick insects, which are very rigid, very linear. And they looked at the movement and feeding, testing behaviour, then diagrams to note the similarities and differences, of course, and they would be extensive. And here we can start to see some of that data collation. And the whole thing is, you know, students then went on to develop posters giving account of the living things they found in their habitat. And finally, they selected and they used digital microscopes. And after releasing the, the invertebrates that been found, they built a 3D model using scrap materials, modelling clay, plastic straws. They built a 3D model of their invertebrate that they used to represent as accurately as possible. So we can see here students working from the ground up developing constant understanding. We've got a learning sequence here. The question for assessment task number two, where would you place a digital card in a sequence like this? Where would it add value? How would it give you more affordances in your classroom so that it's gonna buy you time? It's gonna buy you some constructivist space where you can get down and do some really, really good face-to-face, -face, in the trench, meddler in the middle type teaching. So let's unpack it. The child is a scientist, says PRJ. Picasso says the child is an artist. Artist, scientist, very much a creative enterprise. So how are the animals in this environment suited to particular physical aspects of it? And again, students can go through a whole range of learning activities. 
sketching the percentage of plants cover in a particular environment. So plants can obviously link to species. Species can link to plants' preferences. We can look at food sources. We're starting to build up information, you know, biodata about our own food webs. And this is all happening in our own school grounds. What animals live in this particular environment and where exactly do they live? So we're looking at diversity and populations. We're looking at overall animal numbers and then we're looking at percentage of different types of numbers, where they were found, what they do. You know, are they predatory or are they one of the com compositors? You know, where do they fit in this, this cycle? How do animals' behaviours and structures support their survival? And again, we're looking more diagrams with annotations. The 3D model okay, can represent a particular feature, move, a movement, um, and, and they can then model that to the class. You know, different groups of kids working on different in animals and insects. And how do the animals interact with each other? And again, here we're starting to move towards the feeding relationships, the food chains, and the food webs. And this is where we're starting to now broaden out. We're starting to reach you know, that, that third and fourth E in the cycle, where we're starting to elaborate now. We're starting to move from the, the explore into the explain. Well, you know, they're connected because this one eats that one, okay? And this one lives on this plant and it eats that plant. So all of a sudden, we're getting some causal relationships and we're now able to make reliable attributions. We're starting to build a few hypotheses and make certain connections. So assessment task was all about applying reasoning and in learning in assessment task number one. We did a Peshakusha where you looked at a unit of study. And using that, we looked at where, where learning fitted into that unit of study, what the teacher did, what the student did. And the end result obviously was it contributed you know, to the productive pedagogy, to the engagement, to the cultural enrichment, to all of those things that we want at a productive level for student learning to happen. But when we look at, um, in this case, pre-test, post-test, as Titler suggests, you know, we look at what students know at the start of a unit of study. And then we go through and collecting our data. We, we do all sorts of data mapping exercises. We look at different species on different days. We're producing dynamic data. And in the end, we, you know, we log that data. We find interesting ways, a photocopied sheet of an echidna to look at how many different appearances, regularities over time this, this, this animal appears. We can then do, for instance, a photograph perhaps of a, a, a spider. And we can then have a look and map its movements as frequency charts. Each different group can then come up with a, an idea of, of how busy, how frequent the number of species in their particular environment. So we can see that learning is supported by multimodal learning events. So we know we've got text there. You know, we're going to have books, we're going to have written materials, notebooks. But it can also be spoken. And the spoken text can introduce you know, a wide range of perspectives not just the scientific perspective. Often the scientific perspective is, is written in text. It's there in black and white. It's constant and therefore it is and therefore it must be obeyed. But text that is spoken, and here we can look at some alternate, some complementary models of science and how they can enrich our environment. It can be visual. Diagrams. Kids can become producers of this information. They can make their videos. They can make their own photographs. It can be mathematical. A species can exist not with a diagram as we've got here, but it can exist here as a series of numbers. Wherever we go, you and I know it, we sluice data. Our, our credit cards, our telephone, giving off GPS any point of day. Um, you know, even our TVs, some of our TVs can actually watch us. They're digitally trained with small cameras. So they're monitoring what we're doing at different times of the day. So a lot of our data, a lot of our existence is, is really data-driven, the data-driven body. And we can do this. This is how we can approach science too. You know, we're bordering on STEM here, but we're looking at formula, graphs, tables, how we sluice data and how data can be used to map the world. And it can also be gestural or embodied, role plays, gestures, acting, all of these different things kids can do. You know, what's it like, for instance, to be a fish in a cyclone? You know, let's have a little drama activity. It's role playing. Purposeful observation. Why do things move the way they do? Challenge your learners to conduct scientific observations. And this is one of the things that comes out of the real study. They say in an active classroom environment, students have agency in exploring and interpreting phenomena. They're not told it's right or wrong. They have agency. That means they do it. Representations of science, graphs, tables, drawings, reports, photographs, models are just reasoning tools. 
and kids use these for the purpose of coordinating ideas and evidence in explorations and to knowledge generation and learning. And the best example of this I see is in early childhood centres is, is the touch table where kids go up to a table, the teacher has gathered a whole range of things related to a certain theme and the kids are just able to sit there and handle them. And if you watch those children long enough, they drive them around the tables, they push them, they lift them, they try to make a spider fly and they suddenly realise, hey, that's not going to happen. Why is that not going to happen? And someone says, it's a spider. And all of a sudden, there's reconfiguration going on. Now we've got all this deconstruction happening and the kids are learning through sense making all of these rich tasks they do. Purposeful observation, what we call in the, the early years learning framework as, as intentional teaching. You know, throw those objects down, get the kids to feel them, get them to explore them in a tactile way. And they soon become very, very clear about their purpose and function. A learning sequence. So what we've looked at here is, is you know, students have been asked to select an invertebrate of your choice from a habitat you explored, your school ground. They're required to capture that invertebrate with a container. They then conduct and write a paragraph to represent either how it moves or how it feels, feeds. And there's our literacy component. So in this paragraph, for instance, the teacher may provide keywords. And those keywords may structure a student's observation. Not control it, not limit it, but structure it. How, you know, and then use the internet and reference books to identify the chosen invertebrate and, and, and the science behind its habits, the biology behind its existence, um, its principles of, of, of survival, its, its residence, all these key things we do. And then we can get creative. Picasso is right, you know, Picasso. And so, and so is Piaget. The child is both a scientist and an artist. In fact, up till age five, we were all artists. I used to do fantastic pictures, but when I started drawing my bedroom wall, that soon ended. My dad didn't think they were so fantastic. Okay, get kids to use a magnifier. Get them to look at the face on these creatures. Is that a sad face or a happy face? Oh, maybe it's neither. You know, are we doing something wrong when we think about animals as humans? How helpful is that? Draw a sequence of drawings, build a model, Okay, look at ways animals move and feed. Let's, let's get into the role play of this, you know, and build a 3D model, use paper. Why? These are not expensive materials, readily available, plasticine, clay. Um, and for instance, you know, we, we can do this and then we can photograph. And if you're really clever, you can move on to photo animation and get the kids to create, you know, this creature coming to life, you know, our little own Jurassic Park episodes. So work with, with representations, we're building student knowledge. And we can do this from, you know, a very basic concept here. Here we have student reflections, you know, dawdlings from their actual pads in, in the rules experiment where they've been around their playground and they've collected data. They've done little, little maps and diagrams. They've looked at bugs and they've created different species. And they've then gone through and numbered, measured and, and captured these and come up with some idea of the relationships between them. What they've done is they are building from the ground up a food web. And of course, from here, we can then start to give them the food web framework. And with that framework, they can then start to do some really interesting stuff. Now, one of the tasks on the web this week was to look at a food web and just to, you know, for you guys to brush up on your knowledge. And we can look at producers, first order consumers and second order consumers. And the little diagram we had there, you know, had your reeds, your water boat and your blue tongue lizards. And from this analysis, we get some concept of the first, of the second and of the third levels of, of our consumers and producers in the environment and in the ecosystem and therefore what constitutes the web. Now, I mentioned before rewilding. Rewilding is all pitched up here at the higher order consumers. And rather than, you know, for instance, crocodile conservation, you know, a lot of people at the moment are contesting the notion whether they should conserve crocodiles. People in favour of rewilding would say definitely. Let the largest, you know, the most predatory member of the species come back to the environment to the ecology and then the ecology will find its new balance not the balance it had 200 years ago or 30 or 50 years ago but its new balance and in that new balance nature will return and nature will thrive and this is what we call the new ecology the new conservation or the term and the movement sweeping australia is rewilding now some of you may know something about that loretta said what age were these children these children were age five to six and that they participated in the um uh, the till study um, and I think there was also another group um, in the seven to nine because he did two different uh, um, levels of study, Loretta, in this particular study. So he, um, and some of the diagrams we saw there, some of the, the, the illustrations were from the seven to nine in that last slide when we looked at the food web.
and clearly that was beyond the five to six year olds. In a food web activity, just challenge yourself. Which of your organisations contain chlorophyll? And do we even know what chlorophyll is as teachers? Okay, so you know, some of these, these, I've thrown together some answers here for you. These are little questions that you, know, you don't need to arm yourself with complex science. Okay, chlorophyll we know is the, is the source of plants. It's, it's what light converts into, enables plants to grow and feed. It's an energy source, an energy conversion. Um, so all plants are producers and they use chlorophyll for photosynthesis. So, you know, some like it's converted into energy. Chlorophyll is the food that plants use for energy. Which organisms feed on algae? And again, we're starting to get, you know, to some, some of the consumers in this model. And which feed on fish? So we're starting to get some of the predators. So we're now starting to get some new words. We're growing this science literacy. We're growing this framework. We're extending this food web. And all the time, we're still engaged in a really, really rich local learning sequence. Okay, we're in this learning sequence. And I want you to think as you're going through this learning sequence, where a digital card would add value because that's assessment task number two. Pick a learning sequence, work out where a digital card would come in, what it could do, what power it could have to support learning. Some predictions, really important when you get to a science um, uh, learning sequence. What would happen to organisms in this food web if the, one of these four things happened, if an oil spill uh, occurred nearby? If all the fish were killed, if several house owners nearby started fertilising their lawns. Okay? Now, all of these things have different impacts. We may turn these. We may don't be ashamed to do this to any species, but you could, could quite potentially turn these into observational studies. But right now, they're predictions. And we can look at what oil does when it falls on water. That it, it blocks oxygen. And, and the impact that's going to have on the species that rely on that water, and, and including plants and animals. The water birds rely on fish, and if fish die off, of course, um, they're going to starve. They're going to change, move to areas. They move to other areas. There's overcrowding. We have, you know, displacement. Once we've got displacement, we've got imbalance. Once we've got imbalance, new predators move in. We've got an out of silk, uh, an out of sync food web. Predicted what would happen if the you know, the lawn, lawn fertilisers, and here we can get in some some chemistry, the blur between chemistry and and, and and biology. What impact nitrogen and phosphorus have on soils? Um, what it does to algal bloom, okay? And once we have algal bloom, what algal bloom does to oxygen in the water, and once oxygen starts getting limited, what that does to fish and other organisms. So we can look at producing toxic products simply by fooling with, with the consumptive power of the water or the consumptive role of the water in, in its own ecosystem. And what happens in hot periods? Okay, now it's really interesting if you follow the stock market. Here's a really interesting example for those of you with shares. Um, Harvey Norman, for instance, and the good guys, both, both publicly floated companies, both dropped 35 to 5% today in share value. Why? Well, it's actually due, and they've traced it through, they've analysed it, they're both good companies, they're both great performers, but unfortunately, we're going through an Indian summer. The weather's warmer. People are buying less appliances, less heating, less electric blankets, less heaters, all of these different things. And we're starting to see, therefore, that sales pro rata are dropping off. As sales and revenue drop off, profit estimations drop off, profit predictions drop off, and therefore investment drops off. People are moving their money to more secure and better returns. So, you know, it's not only our, our little ecosystem. Um, prediction can apply to, to a whole range of scenarios. And we can get kids to start small and predict big and then explore those predictions and, you know, until the cows come home, essentially. So a learning sequence, the decomposers, what organisations are decomposers? Where do they live? What do they do? Indicate where they fit into your food web. Now have a think about that. You may know the answer. You may not. But the bacteria and the fungi, the, or the fungi, I really love bacteria and fungi. There's some great exercises you can do in the classroom with compost. You can even make your own DNA just using water. You can map, map your own DNA. Very simple exercises in biology. And, and we can do this you know, by knowing just a little bit about the food system and then going with the exploration, becoming a co-learner with the students in looking at, at you know, how the bacteria, how the fungi work. Good bacteria, bad bacteria. From here, we can go and look at the human gut and we can look at all the great science explosions coming through that, that area, Roman, in our lives. We're looking at a whole range of everything from, you know, from, from fecal 
um, um, replacement um, and fe fecal therapy where you know taking the poo of healthy people putting it into the, the stomachs of unhealthy people with bowel syndromes and problems and watching as that that fecal product actually redesigns the body and creates a healthy and unhealthy system into a healthy one so kids love poo kids absolutely love poo poo is fantastic if you can get kids into poo and you can get lots of oohs and ahs and yucks you've got an engaged classroom you're off and running embrace that run with it building concepts in a food web we can go on and explore food webs on and on you can see here what i'm doing is a learning sequence a sequence of questions questions well designed questions well targeted under bloom's taxonomy to actually extend learners to bring them along the continuum they have long since engaged they've now long since explored They've explained some basic principles. We're now starting to elaborate these principles into different scenarios. So find a food chain from your web with at least four organisms. A food chain. So all of a sudden we've got this new terminology. We've got this new lingua franca here for this, 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 this lesson. So kids are, are booming in their literacy. Place these organisms in a pyramid with the producer at the bottom of the highest and the consumer at the peak. So we're getting some idea here, some idea of food concepts building concepts in the food web and we're getting some idea of um, how these food concepts work. And you know, just from data from um, yes, your average project and, and your average school, a frog, you may be able to map 35 frogs over a period of time. Three million algae, of course that would be mathematical computations and projection, so different applications. Okay, mosquito larvae, again a little bit of research, a little bit of time on the web, perhaps a really good digital card, might be a good place to place one there. Frogs. Okay, again, could be digital card, bit of frog research, types, spot them, identify them, spend two or three days mapping your frog populations, then start charting them, then start identifying them, and then start counting them. So if you count 10 of such frogs in three days, how do we know they're different? Okay, so therefore, how many would we see in a week? And we can get some good idea of our food chain here, of our organisms and our structures. And all of a sudden, we've gone from you know, wondering what's out there to charting what's out there and then mapping the relationships between them. So this learning sequence is going on and on and on. We had this dismembered, this dis discordant food web here and now it's structured in the learner's mind from its bottom sources through to its top consumers and everything in between. We can manage to locate something else on that pyramid level. We have given these children an opportunity to adapt environments and school environments, and they've shifted from observation to concepts via data. So they truly are engaged in science. We could go on and look at some more of Titler's findings. Um, I really like Russell Titler's work. Um, I'm a big fan. He gets very much into engage, engagement and very much into representations, getting students to draw something and from that, building an entire unit of study from that single drawing from all of those kids. So some of the activities, random hunting. Look at these great activities that are part of this, this um, science, you know, this learning sequence. Um, directed hunting, collecting particular animals or types of, so you go from random hunting to directed hunting, okay? So then from directed hunting of different types of animals, we go to different plants. So we're starting to see, you can see the schema building from here to here, from here to here. So we're starting to now look at, first of all, random hunting, what is there? Then we're looking at the relationships or species of animals. Then we're looking at species of plants. And then we start to look at the interdependence of these. And we can see that all of these understandings are mapped beautifully mapped beautifully through this learning sequence. Your task, you've got some favorite science units. I know you do from, from assessment task number one. There are some real preferences you have for how science could be taught. Sustainability features highly in, in many people's thinking, you know, almost a degree of being religion in, in many people's minds. Um, it's really important that we move into sustainable modes. So think of your own science unit. And once you have your own science unit, think about the learning sequence there embedded in that unit and how it's achieved, okay? How it's achieved, how the understandings, the inquiry skills and the human endeavors, the doing of science, the ethical issues, okay? The preservation issues, the extinction issues, the habitat protection, all of these lovely things that we do as endeavor. 
we can see that this really rich learning sequence, you know, it's not only doable, it's also logical, it's rational, and it's relational. And kids can jump into that, and you can see just through four activities, random, directed hunting of animals, directed hunting of plants, and now looking at the observation of structure behaviour, the interdependence. We get an entire view and a complete record and map of an ecosystem. So we're going to try and cover biology over a two-week period. Um, this first week is very much about getting you into biology, about getting you into reacquainting what you know about biology, where you feel comfortable. Now, let's face it, we all feel comfortable in certain spaces and less comfortable in others. Teaching science effectively is about finding a comfort space, a comfort zone. If you can sit in that comfort zone and be an effective teacher, you're going to teach really good science. You're going to have kids interested in their own school grounds. You're going to have them engaged in random hunting, direct hunting with species in mind, plants, and then you're going to be able to say, okay, we've got plants, we've got species of, of animals, we've got some interdependence here, what is it? Okay, what do we need to do then as scientists? What do we need to do as ecologists? What do we need to do as environmentalists? We need to keep that balance. We need to work to support that balance. How do we do that? Okay, science endeavour. Here's where the student becomes empowered. Here's where the student says, I can influence and change the world. I have techniques and tools at my disposal where I can identify a problem. I can identify a solution and I can test how well that solution meets that need. I am a powerful person. And that's what we want our kids to believe. The last point for this week before we look at assessment task number two, okay, setting up mini terrestrial habitats. Um, this is one of my favourite activities that I love to do with kids. And believe it or not, I've actually done it with university students too. Uh, um, kids who've come into a science course and, and they actually identify as knowing nothing about science. We just did the whole science program just using um, science investigations. So we set up mini terrestrial habitats um, and we did it in our own, own university lecture theatre. Um, and some of the habitats became quite elaborate. Some went on to be preserved by the university. For instance, we had a little snake enclosure, all kinds of things that we had. So yeah, it's really a great thing to do and you can do it in your classroom with fish tanks and the important thing of course is the release of, of, of the, the creatures at, at the end of the study and so when we look at that we can see you know we get an activity like building up a terrestrial habitat we've got all our science understandings there on display we can observe them we can match them we can build data we can even film them and photograph them we can make dynamic charts on our wall we can have little markers that we move along lines we can be totally integrated with this environment. We can create environmental and science inquiry skills. Um, we look at a problem, we look at a phenomenon and say, how are we going to investigate that? How do we understand that? How do we get to understand that more? What, what science would help us here? And then we can get into values and attitudes, the human endeavour. So it's one thing for science to be asking curious questions. It's another thing to be balancing that with concern for the welfare of the ecosystem. Because once we start to ask these curious questions and we've got our inquiry skills and we know the science understandings, we often know that science has accidental byproducts. And some of those byproducts are environmental harm. So how do we control against environmental harm? How do we manage that? And we get students to start to brainstorm here. And look, I've had some amazing um, ex experience here. Um, the most memorable is a group of kids from Weeper. Um, we were doing a, a Lego project one year and they designed um, nano um, bait fish and they painted that design and the reason they came up with the nano bait fish because living in Weeper, there's a lot of fishing, um, it's high scale fishing and we're starting to see the decline of some um, fi fish areas um, and with that, with fish, pop fish populations um, and of course when people go fishing they use certain bait fish and some of the bait fish were becoming uh, endangered and some extinct. So these young kids decided they would design nanobots that replicated the swimming patterns of certain bait fish and they would be able to sell these to fishermen and save the species from being completely uh, completely downgraded and made extinct um, and so those kids with the help of their parents went through and did the initial designs they registered the prototype and two of them now are at university studying science and, and looking at the nanotechnology field with a view to developing that nanoscience and other nanosciences into a commercial product. So these kids were eight years old and they're going to change 
you know, they're going to change the future of several species. So kids do this. Kids get it. Okay? It's really important to, to realise they are scientists. TPAC, content, technology and pedagogy intersect. And, you know, this is really what assessment task two is all about. You've got a learning sequence and that learning sequence, for instance, has pedagogical content in it. It's got content knowledge in the form of science understandings. It's got pedagogical knowledge in the terms of, let's face it, it's using certain pedagogies. Now, it's an inquiry pedagogy. It may, for instance, be the 5E's model. It may be KWHL. It could be a wide range of minor isolated pedagogies, okay, um, problem-based learning, um, it could be guided inquiry. Any inquiry, any pedagogy you know has got, got a, a subset to it. It's got a look and a feel, okay? It's got techniques, strategies associated with it. The content we know comes from the biological or the earth and space science domain, okay? The technological content or technological knowledge is your digital card. It's the, the framework if you like, the artefact in which you're going to embed both pedagogy and content. It's what Russell Stannard talked about as your flipped product. Okay, so let's move on and have a look at this task. Assessment task number two is your digital card. Um, two parts. And I had a really interesting question this week, a great question, in fact, um, about how many words um, should part A be? And I'll talk about that in a minute. You'll be shocked at my answer. Um, but I think it should be between 1,500 and 2,000 words, part A. Why? Because part A, if you do part A well, then part B is, is great. All you need to do is develop two cards that represent and reflect it, the, the pedagogies you've done and described in part A. You've done all your connections. You've done all your legwork here. Sorry, someone have a question there? Um, Colin, it's actually Maxine. This is probably like a really silly question, but what is actually digital cards? Um, is it like an A4 paper? Um, yeah, it's a really silly question, but I'm confused with the digital cards. Now, Ma Maxine, I thought we'd established there's no such thing as a silly question. Okay. I, I actually think it's a very good question. Now, a digital task card is, is a card that can take, um, it's got to have some sort of physical form. Um, and I would argue because you'll be working either with um, foundation to year three or with zero to five, um, it's most likely going to want to be laminated and it's most likely going to want to be printed. So it's got to be a printable card because accessibility is everything. So really, when we talk about a digital task card, it is just a printed version of a task card, a card that is in digital form. It could be a Word document. No, I don't like Word. It could be a HTML document. Um, it could be uh, another document in digital form, um, a PDF with hot links. It could be any kind of digital form that took students on a learning journey, utilising different resources and leading to an outcome in your learning sequence. Does, does that make sense? Okay. Sort of. So would PowerPoint, like if you do PowerPoint, um, not that I'm still thinking about it, but would that be like a digital card to put like diagrams and stuff on or would that not be a digital card? Okay. Now that's probably what we'd call your digital repository. So let's, let's go back a step. Now, if you watched Russell Stannard last week, he basically said, you know, give your students a flipped classroom. Now a flipped classroom basically can be a Word document with instructions and hyperlinks. But those hyperlinks are going to go somewhere. And, and in your case, they may, for instance, hyperlink to a PowerPoint. And that PowerPoint may contain embedded video. It may contain questions. It may contain little quizzes that you've done using PowerPoint where they can select boxes and get feedback on the answers. Okay, that's the kind of thing a PowerPoint would do. It would be more like a repository. The digital card would be the printed tool that you gave kids, which could be, you know, really simple, saying, hello, welcome to this unit. In order to get to this unit, link to this page. On this page, you will find a PowerPoint, and this PowerPoint, start by doing this. Some people will use Weebly. Some people use Wiki. Um, on, on the um, subject homepage, there is a link under the right-hand side of the page to a whole range of resources. Um, so it would it, sorry, so it would be like a student booklet. But a digital form of a booklet. But a digital form. 
yeah, a blog or a wiki or a, a PowerPoint with hyperlinks, um, a PowerPoint that was interactive, okay, something. So, you know, that would be, that would be your repository. That, that, so, but, and, and to answer your question, the digital card sends students to the repository, all right? So it, it would have to be a printed verse, something you could print and send home with kids. And for instance, you know, at, at preschool, kids could take a digital card home, sit down with mum and dad, mum and dad would open the web, uh, go, to, go to the link and there would be your, your folder and your folder would have your PowerPoint in it and then they'd work through the PowerPoint with their child. And that PowerPoint would get them to do different things like maybe go to a simulation game and watch some plants grow and then answer a little short quiz or two about what happened. And what would happen if you added more water and less sunlight and all those kinds of things. So that's your repository. And some people will do that in PowerPoint, as you suggested. Some will do it in Wiki. Some will do it as a blog. Some will do it using a range of digital formats. And some will do it as a web page. Okay. But the digital card is, you know, the simple printable thing. But that's then behind that digital card has to be pedagogy, has to be an activity and a learning sequence. Okay, so there has to be something behind it. Something Sorry, Colin. Do. So does it, is there any topic for the digital task card at all? Or? No, we're not setting a topic. What we're asking you to do is, is create your own learning sequence. So already you've spent time in, in assessment task number one looking at a unit of study. You may decide to stay with that unit of study and you may decide, for instance, yeah, feathers, furs, or, or that's what I'm going to do. Okay, so I'm going to actually look at the 11 lessons that were in that unit and I'm going to pick three of them as a learning sequence. Okay, so I know where, and okay, and these three lessons happen to occur at the explore and explain stage. Right, okay, so they're the three lessons I'm going to use. So I've got a sequence of learning and they've already got pedagogies embedded in them. Okay, but they're, they're real-time pedagogies, they're face-to-face -face pedagogies. Perhaps there may be some digital pedagogies involved. So what you do is you take that learning sequence you've identified. You don't have to create it. You take it from a pre-existing one. Your task is design a digital card. And in part A, you'll justify the pedagogy that you're using for that digital card and the approaches, the teaching strategies embedded in that digital card and why it's a good thing. And I'll come to that in a minute because I've got some suggestions there because I had another really great email um, from Michaela who asked, you know, what do we do in there? You know, what should we look at? Um, so, you know, to answer your question, your, you know, your digital card really, um, it, it's, it's got to have pedagogy behind it. Okay. So in other words, it's got to have a rationale as to why you're doing what you're doing in a digital format. And it's got to be based on a lesson sequence and, you know, to make it simple, I would make it from an existing unit of, of primary connections. I'd pick a lesson sequence of three. And, and I'll talk about it in a minute, no more than three because it gets too big. Three lessons, and let's face it, the inquiry model says a lesson has to have three steps, an inquiry process. The first one is testing for misconceptions, diagnostic. The second step is an investigation. And the third step of inquiry teaching is discussion, a classroom discussion. So you need really three lessons. And in those three lessons, you've now got to design a digital card at one stage of that sequence either the first, the second, or the third lesson, you've got to design a digital card which is going to enrich and focus student learning. And again, one of the qualities of the digital card is got to be for small groups of students or individual students. Does, does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Colin, it's Maxine again, sorry. So in simple words, the digital card is actually the activity that you're going to do behind the materials that you're going to put on the PowerPoint for the children. That are on the right line. Yeah, the digital card will be a series of simple explanations, okay, with directions on where to go and what to do. Oh, okay. okay. Yep, okay. and yeah. that... Again, you're going to have to look at your learner age. If you're talking about kids zero to five, you're not going to want to use very big language because they can't read. Yes. So it may have to be pictorial. So you're going to have to look at icons. You're going to have to work out how your digital card is going to work best. And yeah, keep going. Yeah, and you may want to, you know, 
take it home. It's actually homework. I'm flipping my classroom. You're going home to work with mum and dad. Um, and if they can't do it at home, they can do it, you know, with, with parents or with, with support in, in the, the early childcare centre. But the reality is the digital card is meant to stand alone. It's meant to have explicit instructions. It's meant to be a direct and, and, and intentional pedagogy. And it's meant to serve a really clear purpose in your, um, in your learning sequence. So it's got to add value somewhere. And Nicole, Noel, sorry, has got a, um, a statement here. Can it be a Word document linking to a Weebly site that has links and PDFs? Absolutely. That's a really simple resolution. And the Word document can contain pictures for younger age groups, um, prompts, all those kinds of things that, that make the text accessible to the, the age group and the learner that you want to target. So, you know, Noelle obviously is, is over the top of this. She's getting it. How many pages would a digital card be? It determines, um, from Lisa, um, it really de is determined by where you're using the digital card. So if you're using it at the very start of uh, an explore stage where you want to look at um, types of frogs, um, your digital card, you know, probably would need to be no more than a page. Um, and you may structure some activities there um, about what is a frog? What is a toad? What is the difference? How would we classify a frog? How many different species of frogs, you know, exist here in this, this environment? You know, what characteristics do frogs like to live in, et cetera, et cetera. So your digital card um, would be about building knowledge and comprehension in that, in that scenario. And it would probably be you know, one to one and a half pages long, but it would be a sequence of steps the learner goes through. And the steps would be to go through them independently and the steps would be well structured and well laid out. Your, the resources you're using would be explicit and clear and reliable. That's really important too, because when we get your digital cards, we actually test drive all of them and assess them. So, and your pedagogy you know, has got to be relevant and supported. So, you know, how long would it take? Most digital cards really shouldn't be more than one, two pages. You know, really, if you're going more than that, you're, you're getting into a web quest, which is probably a little bit too much. Um, and really, ideally, um, one page is good, but somewhere between one to two pages, you know, is, is quite tolerable and it gives you lots of scope to do some explaining and sort of saying, okay, now here's three questions for you. Um, you can write your answers in here, go here, do this, um, and you can become quite, you know, didactic and quite instructional. Um, or you could just leave spaces in there for them to go and, and look at different types of frogs and draw their favourite one. Okay, there's a whole range of ways you could do it. Sorry, Colin. Yes. It says um, year level from year seven to year nine. Is that supposed to be age seven to nine? No, that's year level seven to nine. Um, if you're a primary school teacher and you're doing primary training and you find yourself in a P10 or, or, or P12 school, um, you could find yourself teaching up to year nine as a primary okay. school teacher. So what we're doing is be, saying to you, be prepared for that, that whack on the head because um, yep. it, it may come and even though other teachers will gather around you and support you um it's nice to sort of say hey guys relax i got this yeah been, okay. been, been here done that i know how to handle this i know where to find the acs i know how to look at the levels i know what they mean i know what the elaborations are got the strands down pat comfortable with at least three of the sub strands got a little bit of chemistry i'm not so, so strong <laughs> with but you know and it's a nice place to be yeah, when you feel that way but the thing you. is they they must be in digital format these cards. So um, you can hand them, they've got to be printable. That's one of the things we have, but when you assess them, they'll be digital. When you submit them, we'll see them as digital cards, but they've got to be printable for young people, you know, for, for young learners. Um, and, you know, ideally in a perfect world, as I said, you'd probably laminate them for fingerprints and so that they survive at least you know, 20 minutes um, in, in an early childhood center. So, yeah, but they've got to be digital format. And, and that means they've got to be interactive. Um, they've got to take you to activities. Um, and they've got to be, you know, activity driven, you know, they've got to be interactive and exciting. So, um, and they've got to be engaging and inquiring. all the things we talked about in your Pacia Kusha, you know, the digital card has got to be a mini representation of that. So it's your first time for some of you to do it. So yeah, we're here to learn. Um, so don't think you, you should have the answer right now. Um, but in reality, over the next couple of weeks, we should be working towards that answer. So it's two cards. And as you can see, the, the upper and lower ends of the curriculum, that's what we're targeting. And what we want to see from you there is flexibility, that you can take a concept in biological science and design it for, for preschoolers. You can take a concept in earth science and design it for kids in years, years zero to three. And again, relax. The foundations units in, 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 you know, in 
year P to, to three are actually designed to be flexible. They don't, they don't, you know, target only, um, they don't only target um, the foundation's year. They're designed to be pulled down into the early years or designed to be stretched out in, into the upper years, years um, one, two, and in some cases, three. Now, Lisa wrote there, when will assessment one be returned? Um, anyone who's, who's tuned into these sessions and, and read the, the forums will know that actually it's due to be returned at the end of this week. Um, we did say 10 working days from submission. I still have about eight people out on extension um, with those pieces, but I know your markers are working hard to get them ready for you for Friday. So that's when we're hoping to release results. I know there's about 50 lots of results in, in the, in the um, Moodle already. All I have to do is press the release button and you'll get them. So hopefully the rest will be loaded up over the next few days. So let's briefly just talk again about assessment task two. Um, it's a written task. Part A is a written task. Um, and there are some samples I've put on, on Moodle for you to look at. Bear in mind that they're just samples. They're not exemplars. And someone says, mine says it's graded, but that's it. Absolutely, Kylie. Yeah, you won't see it until I release it. So it'll tell you it's graded, and that's good news. It means everything's in and everyone's sitting there waiting, happy like happy little hens. But you won't see it un until um, I hit the release button. And, and that is to, again, um, unfortunately, we have some students who've been delayed for medical health and a whole range of reasons. Um, so come Friday, when, when we've reached our mandatory 10 days, I will be able to release them to you. Okay. Um, so Gregson, um, text page 25762 has got some resources. Page 252 lists some ideas you can look at um, for your digital tasks. There's the ICT Tools website block on the right hand of Moodle, where you look at Glogster, Wikispace, Wixcom. Okay, you can see there's a whole range of online resources you can use to build and create spaces and store your documents. And, and through week eight, and from this point forward, I'm gonna bombard you with different resources. So in, in week eight, biological sciences, I've put a whole lot of simulations and games uh, in the explain and elaborate stages of week eight. So you can see them, they're there. And, and these are the types of things you may want to adapt and include in your digital cards. So we're not throwing you to the wolves. We're not saying go find Mecca. We're saying, look, Mecca's all around you. You know, shop, make decisions, justify your decisions and present them as a card. And what we're asking you to do is the task for this week is to try and find two tasks. Okay, looking at plant and animal biology is the, is the challenge and try and develop a little mini digital card. Try it in a situation where the stakes are low and we can give you feedback. If you do it and put it on the forum, lots of people will give you feedback and then you can take that feedback and apply it to the actual assessment task. An interesting question from uh, Jessie and um, it was a very interesting question where she sort of said, um, I want some clarification. Yeah, we all do. Um, I'm doing one card for children prep three and the other card for children to zero five. That's great. That means Jesse's doing the early childhood um, version. Where do I find the strands when it comes to identifying the ACS early years? Now, the great thing about Jesse's question, I love these questions because she goes ahead and answers it. And the answer is absolutely right. The ACS um, for years P to three, foundation to three, is your guide. That's where you'll get your science understanding, science as human endeavor and science inquiry um, um, st uh, strands. Substrand, sorry. And the early years learning framework, you've got five learning outcomes in, embedded in that document. And, and they're the five things that you will use to create your, um, your focus for your, your digital card. So don't feel that that's all I'm gonna say on that. What I've done is I've actually made a video. Um, I've compiled a short video, about 27 minutes long, and it explores the early years learning framework and links it to the ACS for assessment task number two. And I've placed that video in the Zoom session links. I'm not doing it in this session because it relates only to early childhood learners. Um, but the important thing is, um, and I'm using the national framework here um, because the ACS is a national framework. I'm using the national early years framework. Um, but I've put it in the Zoom session links and just go and have a look at it. And I think you'll just find it confirms your own thinking. There's nothing new in it but it just confirms your own thinking that there are you know, five learning outcomes under the EYLF and many of those learning outcomes, their elaborations can link directly to science teaching. Okay, and it gives you some ideas on what they might be. Another interesting question, the last thing I probably wanna talk about tonight because it's getting on. What is the word count we're expecting for part A? Um, and there is no specified word count. So if you, you, know, you don't do 1500 words, you're not, you're not gonna get knocked around the head with a plank. You're not going to um, have your first child stolen and sold on the black market. There's nothing like that, okay? Um, all, it, 
all it means is have you really answered the question um, and if we unpack this question even though there's no structured word limit for it um, it's got a fair bit to do part a you've got to do a lot of work in there you've got to describe explain and justify each of the pedagogies you've chosen and there's some some heavy lifting there now a lot of people believe it or not in assessment task number one still quote Gregson as an authority how many times were you asked not to service cold Gregson do not service cold Gregson we hate Gregson cold we're not even that fond of Gregson hot so don't serve your marker Gregson Gregson is, 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 is a, a meta-analysis it's a, a scan of existing research real research is about going to the articles and getting it yourself so if you've submitted Gregson already expect to be pulled up and called on that okay yeah it's really important you do that so something around 15 to 2,000 2, words and why this is a suggestion only I'm not saying you have to do that many because you may drive yourself crazy and everybody else in the process if you can do more with less words that's a great thing my hunch is it's gonna be damn hard and here's why this is this is how I responded to Michaela's um, statement your introduction basically 350 words you got a lot of work to do there what you're going to do is talk about teaching strategies and really in the inquiry process you've got three basic models closed guided and open each of them is going to have a different set of pedagogies attached so one of them is is you know and you're going to choose i'm not going to tell you which if we for instance we want to use closed inquiry you want to use that when it's teacher guided okay another of these is um, for instance maybe open inquiry and we may want to use that in you know the the final uh, evaluation stage of, of the last e when our students are uh, you know out there exploring and linking knowledge to new frameworks so then you go on to say as a concluding statement for introduction tell us what you're going to tell us this discussion will explore two pedagogies um, one will be this one will be that and how each pedagogy can apply to a learning sequence for students studying science at year three level in uh, a biological sciences unit of study and at year four level in a for instance um, it may be a, an earth space science unit study entitled so by the end of your introduction we should have no problem with what you're doing we should be entirely clear about what you're doing okay and that was a problem with the patient kusha some people just begun and just started speaking at 90 miles an hour from the very first slide and the markers were left there sitting wait a minute this is an assault to my senses what the hell are you talking about what topic are you doing what is your argument how are you breaking it down please do me you know the decency have the respect to tell me as your audience what it is you're going to do here because otherwise I can't come with you and it's really important you do that that you respect your audience you write and you present with the reader in mind okay it's it's, it's not seduction but it's it's the next best thing you know you're actually trying to bring this person along with you so from there you'll do your your first part of your main body is going to be pedagogy one and I reckon about 650 words now 250 words is a paragraph so we're talking about three short paragraphs here so we're not talking about a lot but in there you're gonna to have to describe the pedagogy and you're gonna to have to use sources if it's problem-based learning who's your source identify its context of use when is it used why is it used what of its strengths what of its learning effect okay we looked at effective strategies give some examples what does teaching look like when someone's doing problem learning what does learning look like and what are the strengths and its affordances okay why do people engage in this so what you're doing here is you're building the case for your own digital card and you can then go on and say as your final part here in the first part of your your main body I've used this strategy as a learning sequence in my digital card in this way so again the marker sitting there saying wow great introduction I know which ones you're doing and I know why you're doing them I even know your unit focus your learning sequence your first pedagogy makes great sense to me your second pedagogy wow it's quite different so again I'm going to get a really good view of you as a teacher here across different strengths and affordances and you're applying two different pedagogies at two different year levels in two different areas wow I'm really looking forward to this and finally your conclusion tell us what you told us you've identified two different pedagogies in a learning sequence each contributes to a effective teaching because the discussion have illustrated how this pedagogy can be used at this level and this pedagogy can be used at this level to 
create deeper understanding, enhance rich, deeper learning by, and tell us why. Just remind us. You've already told us up here. Just repeat it briefly. And the digital card attached to this assessment develop these ideas further and provide an applied example of each pedagogy and use it in context. So this is why I think it's going to take you 1,500 words to 2,000 words to do part A. Because part B is really about two digital cards and they should really exemplify what you're writing here and they should really exemplify what you're writing here. So all the marker needs to do is now go from part A and down and look at your cards. Do they do what you say they're going to do? Do they create the affordances you say they're going to create? Are they consistent with the pedagogies you describe? So you're really putting yourself on show here. And that's part A. And that's why I think, you know, to answer Mikhail's question, you know, we're talking about 1,500 to 2,000 words. So it's really important that we look at those two pedagogies and by the time you finish part A, you should have that polemic circle, that structure, where you've gone from your beginning here, you've gone through your introduction to get to your two pedagogies. By the time you finish your two pedagogies here, you are on your way back to the start, telling us what you told us and why these two pedagogies are really important for learners. Then it's a matter of putting together your cards and having some fun, designing it, for your students with your learners in mind. All right, that was my last slide. I didn't realise. Any questions or comments, please? I know I've probably thrown a few cats amongst the pigeons there, and you may need some time to digest it. Um, Colin, it's Rosalyn here. Can I just clarify one thing? Sorry if you're repeating yourself. No um, problem. Can I just... So if I'm doing a Weebly site, for instance, um, yes. I organise all my material on that, so I'm doing planets, and I organise all my material on that, and from there, as um, the marker or as my um, tutor, you then can print off two digital cards, one for zero to three, for instance, and one for, um, sorry, from prep to three and one for zero to five. Is that, is that, what, is that correct? Yep, that those cards must be printable. Yes. Yeah, but there's only the one Weebly site, for instance? Weebly would be fantastic, but don't forget to invite the marker to that so yeah. what, what you'll have to oh, yeah. Yeah, no. create an identity for the market to get into that Weebly because sometimes they're locked up and yeah. I know, yeah. yeah. Um, but that's correct. That's what we're doing. on that, Within that Weebly site, we're creating those two digital cards for those two different age groups. That's right, yeah. Rosalind. That's, that's beautiful if you can do it that way, you know, and Weebly is quite transportable to Queensland schools. Okay, thank you. Yeah, fabulous. Any other questions or comments? Colin, I have a question. Oh, sorry, no, I'll, you go first. No, you can go first. I'll go next. Okay. The activities that link to the um, digital cards, are they ones that we make or are they already made? They're already made. They're ones that you curate. Okay. Yeah. And references, how do we reference in a Word document? Yes, at the end of your Word document, you put all your references in. So you'll reference the academic sources you, you quote for each of your pedagogies. Yeah. And, and you'll also reference um, the websites and simulations that you're including for your learners. Okay. Thank you. Good questions. Okay, Colin, it's Noelle. Fire away, Noelle. Um, so I have jumped ahead a bit and I have created half of my um, content for my earth and space sciences. However, I um, read it from the task description and I've done for year five. And the content can't be changed to a lower grade. So will I have to redo that card? No. No, just, just tell us it's for year five. So I'm doing year five and year nine. I'm challenging myself with year nine um, biology. So is that fine? That's absolutely perfect, Noelle. You have some, I mean, the reason I put in those parameters is to give people a clue to, to do disparate year levels um, and not, you know, not repeat the same unit for the same year level because you're not really challenging yourself. What you're doing is challenging yourself and all you need to specify in your introduction, year five and year nine, you will not raise an eyebrow. As a matter of fact, you'll probably get a round of applause. I just really want to um, look into the solar system. Fabulous. Yeah, I agree with you. And that belongs at five to nine. Yes. 
Yeah, good on you. Good strategy. Fully support that. And unfortunately, when we write these tasks, we have to strike a balance between being prescriptive and leaving them open enough for you to be engaged and interested to take control of them. And, and what you've done, Noel, is take control of it. Um, and that's just brilliant. I, you know, I think that's great. So no one would bat an eyelid. As a matter of fact, we would support you taking control of the task, being interested enough to say, this is how I want to do it and this is why I want to do it. And all we can do is just applaud that because that's what we want from, from our students is to be that interested and to care that much that they actually want to take control of the task and do it their way. Um, right, who else? I've got a question here from Lisa with regard to the outcomes in the EYLF. I'm using the QKLG as well. Can I use this? If yes, just specify, Lisa, that you're doing that. Okay, so that your mark is not going to look for stuff from the EYLF. Just specify that you're using, you're using the Queensland version. Um, the reason I, I summarised the national version is because the ACS is national, so I was doing apples for apples. But all you need to do is specify. Okay, and it's the same point from Noel. Just specify. If you say it in your introduction, then that's what we look for. Fabulous. Good on you. If there are no other questions, I better hit the record button on this one. Um, uh, YouTube is going to hate me because it's going to take a long time to load up. It's a longer session. Someone just, uh, Loretta. I, I have a question. Um, Colin, um, I know with um, assessment task one, um, the guide would be to use the primary connections. That would be a simple resolution. Uh, maybe even units. But, but I've it already. Because I'm, um, because I use basically my own uh, stream of investigation. That's okay too. That's is, okay. That, is that okay? okay? That is absolutely okay. Just most people prefer not to do that amount of work and they prefer to use something pre-existing because it's safe and it's structured okay. along the five E's. And, okay. you know, you can just borrow a learning sequence rather than create one. But if you have one that you're passionate about, yeah. go for it. Now, there's one that I'm very passionate about um, with the prep to you three, uh, which would be the Great Barrier Reef. Yeah. Um, but then I have to introduce them to the early years, my space, earth and space sciences. So uh, I've got to wrap my head around that one. <laughs> yes, yes. And that's every choice has a consequence. And that, yeah. the assessment in this unit is deceptively simple, Loretta, and you're picking up on the nuances of it really well. Um, if you do one unit in this format, then you're compelled to do the other unit. So you're challenging yourself constantly. You're, yeah. you're shape-shifting, you're changing brain sides, you're flipping things around all the time, and um, you're thinking on your feet. And as a teacher, that's, that's your greatest skill. So am I on the right track with the early years if, for argument's sake, I do earth and space sciences? Um, we are bringing narratives um, Beautiful. And that with the children, and then they do drawings for argument's sake, like asteroids um, hitting Earth or something like that. Um, just brainstorm. Yeah, look, I'm excited already. It sounds fabulous. <laughs> yeah. Okay, because that because that's probably what I because children are always uh, interested in when's the asteroid going to hit Earth or something like that. So I'm that's going right. along those lines for children, young youngsters to explore. Fabulous, Loretta. You're, you're, and, and look, not everybody, as I said, wants to do the level of work you're doing. Um, so people are happy to tap into existing units and get a learning sequence from that. Yeah. But if you're creating your own learning sequence, yeah. just tell us in your introduction and, you know, it's from that point forward, it's resolved. It's yeah. fine. Okay. Thanks, Colin. You're welcome. If there are no other comments, I better hit the record button on this one and, and I'll get home sometime around about midnight. Thank you all. I mean, I, I know it's that time of year when assessment's flying, um, colds and flus are about, um, family are wanting some time, um, all really important stuff. So thank you for giving some of yours to this unit and some to me. Um, I really appreciate your commitment and, and have really enjoyed marking the bulk of your, your assignments and, and ideas. So um, we're aiming for a Friday turnaround and, and hopefully we don't disappoint. I'm just relying on my markers meeting that deadline as well. So thank you all and good night. <laughs>